I'm Wendy Frew and I'm your moderator for this evening's McKellar 2022 Election Candidate Forum, co-hosted by Northern Beaches Climate Action Network and Voices of McKellar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a producer and presenter at community station Radio Northern Beaches, 88.7, 90.3. And for many years I wrote for mainstream media, including the Sydney Morning Herald, the AFR and the BBC. Before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land. We pay respect to the traditional custodians of this land for whom sovereignty was never ceded. Now, like many of you, I live on the land of the Garrigal clan and we pay respect to them and to their elders. Now, I'll quickly explain how this evening's event will work. Each candidate will deliver a three minute opening statement about who they are and what they stand for. Then I'll open it up to you, the public, to ask for questions. The whole event is going to be live streamed and later on if you are standing up to ask a question but you don't want your photo taken, uh, please indicate that when, when you're standing up. Before we begin, I'm going to hand you over to Sheila Hogan from Voices of McKellar and Sheila is going to present a snapshot of a soon to be released McKellar's, McKellar Matters report. Thanks Sheila. Thank you, Wendy. Good evening. What an amazing turnout. We're so thrilled to have all of you here tonight. And I'd just like to genuinely express our respect and gratitude to the panelists that accepted our invitation to join this evening. Thank you so much. For those of you that don't know us, the Voices of McKella is a community organization, grassroots. We do not align with any candidate or party. Our aim is to encourage the highest standard of community engagement and consultation and the highest standard of political representation for the members of McKella. In short, our interest is to have your voices heard and counted. To help set the scene for this evening, I will be sharing a preview of the findings from our second McKella Matters report. These findings are a result of in-depth community conversations over the last 18 months. Beginning in the late 2020 and wrapping up just over two weeks ago, a total of 775 participants. The information was collected in person in people's homes, in their gardens, around their kitchen tables, and even in a few RSLs. We also conducted live Zoom virtual sessions and made an online survey available. In all sessions, the same 10 questions were asked and responses recorded anonymously. What follows is a snapshot of the McKellar community, their values, concerns, and opinions on the issue of political representation. All right, so I'll talk to the question behind the crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> When asked what qualities made for a good political representative, the majority of respondents rated honesty and integrity as the top, with community over party as a close second. Someone who listens and is not a career politician also rated very highly. Next. In response to the question, do you feel you have an adequate voice in the way you are represented, only 7% said yes. Unfortunately, a clear majority, 73%, did not feel they had adequate input on, into the way they were represented. As for the reasons for their answers, the majority indicated that they believed their representative would not listen, but rather follow their party over community interests. Another high percentage of responses suggested they had actually tried, but had given up and or had received inadequate responses when they attempted to engage with their representative. This is when it gets really interesting. <laughs> when asked about any particular topics of concern, the highest responses related to the lack of action on climate change. As you can see from a very clear graph, 57% of people cited it as a primary concern. Another significant area of focus was the lack of accountability and transparency in government, linked to the influence of political donors and lobbyists. Other topics that ranked in the top 10 issues included environment, media diversity, 
housing affordability, and economic and indigenous inequality. Here are just a few quotes from the McKellar residents that engaged in these discussions. We hope the findings of this report help inform all of the candidates about what constituents of McKellar are looking for from their elected representative. In the long term, we hope this report helps to foster the highest quality of political representation for the residents of McKellar over the next three years. That's your preview. And as I said, the rest of the report will come out in the next couple of weeks, but thank you so much. And look, I'm just doing the, pan the free standing mic thing because you wouldn't be able to see me behind that, <laughs> that thing. So, we invited all the McKellar candidates to this forum and we're delighted that five of them were able to make it tonight. We're pretty disappointed that our um, incumbent, uh, Liberal Jason Felinski, wasn't able to come tonight, it declined the invitation. And um, unfortunately, the One Nation candidate, we didn't, we only found out very late in the day who the candidate was. Uh, in fact, I looked it up this afternoon to check. We weren't able to get in contact with, I think it's Darren Dixon, and apologies if I got that name wrong. So unfortunately, two, two of the candidates aren't here tonight. Now I'm going to ask our five candidates to come up to the stage and just to be totally unbiased, they're gonna pick numbers out of a hat and that will determine the order in which they give their little spiels. So if you, if you could please come up to the stage. So I'll introduce our candidates in this order first, which is not their speaking order, just because it's easier. And I'll start from my, I was about to say far right, my right. Um, <laughs> um, Dr. Sophie Scomps is a GP who's lived on the Northern Beaches for 22 years and she's standing as an independent. Next we have uh, Avalon Beach local Paula Goodman and she's the ALP's candidate. Paul <laughs> <laughs> Paula is a WIRES volunteer and a Women's Resilience Centre advocate and she also stood at the last council election. Ethan Hernjack represents the Greens. Ethan, who stood at the last Northern Beaches Council election as well, plans to do a double degree in environmental law and management. Barry Steele is standing for New Party, TNL, previously known as the New Liberals. Barry is a computer science expert and business consultant who lives in DY. <laughs> and finally, Christopher Ball. He's lived on the Northern Beaches for most of his life and he's been involved in full-time Christian ministry. After voting Liberal all of his life, he has now swapped his allegiance to the United Australia Party. Now, 
the way it's going to work tonight, they, each candidate will give their uh, little description of themselves. We've got a timer and a bell. So after, you've got three minutes each, after two and a half minutes, the bell will ring and then a second bell will ring at three minutes and if you keep going, I may be forced to cross the stage and grab the microphone from you. Um, look, we only have to look around the world to realise how fragile democracy can be. So please show respect to all of our candidates and to other people in the audience. So no heckling or abuse, please. Likewise, candidates, please don't interrupt the other speakers. There will be lots of time later on to elaborate on your main policies. So... Let's get started with our first speaker, who is, which is great, our youngest tonight. It's fantastic to have uh, our youth represented, and that's Ethan Hernjack from the Greens. myself. I'm planning on studying environmental law and management at Macquarie University in July and I'm passionate about creating a cleaner, greener and fairer future for the Northern Beaches. I've lived on the Northern Beaches for my entire life on, uh, within French's Forest for the last 15 years. I've represented French's Forest on the Northern Beaches Council's Youth Advisory Group for the past year where I've uh, where I've um, where I fought for the um, young people in our community to receive better access to council services and to improve their well-being across the Northern Beaches, which is something that I'll continue to do if elected with a youth advisory reference group that will accompany me to Canberra and give input on policy dis uh, discussions and policy uh, decision making. I'm also a volunteer with the School Strike for Climate Movement as an organiser. I also volunteer as a marshal at their strikes. In 2021, I stood as the Greens candidate for the Narrabeen Ward in the local council elections, where I fought for strengthening renters' rights, improving access to affordable housing on the northern beaches, and creating a climate-resilient community. I'm running in this election to represent the youth. There are less than six MPs out of 227 in our government that are younger than 35. It's absolutely appalling that these decisions about young people and our future are being made with people that have no personal stake in it. The campaign that we're running in McKellar is a grassroots campaign with little resources because the Greens as a party take no corporate donations and we cap all individual donations at $6,600 per annum. The core policies that we're taking to this election are as follows including dental and mental health and Medicare, a safe climate and an end to the extinction crisis, a home you can afford, free education, preschool to PhD, and an end to corruption with a federal ICAC and strong reform of our political donation laws. I'm extremely grateful that Voices of McKellar and uh, MB Can have organized this forum tonight. It's a great example of participatory democracy, which is just so important as we move into an uncertain future. This election, I urge you to vote climate when you get to the ballot box, in the lower house and in the Senate. This election, vote integrity, vote climate, vote green. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ethan. Next up is Barry Steele from TNL. Barry. Thank you. In the spirit of reconciliation, TNL acknowledges the traditional custodians and owners of, of the country throughout Australia and the Pacific. To their, we, we respect and we acknowledge their connect, connection to land, sea and community. We pay our spe respects to elders past, present and emerging and we extend that respect to all Indigenous people of Australia and uh, Pacific Islanders that are among peoples today. 
My name's Barry, and I'm at the other end of the age group to Ethan. Um, I have to apologise for a number of things. I was born in Queensland, and I'm left-handed. So I'm, it's taken me a while to get here. Uh, I, uh, I grew up as a result in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. When I was Ethan's age, everyone could get a job. We had a middle class. We had billion, millionaires, not billionaires. I have been trying to understand the crazy economic frameworks that we have had in this country since the 1980s. And so I've spent a lot of time recently studying neoliberalism and neoclassical economics. And I joined, them, I joined TNL because Margaret Thatcher lied when she said there's no such thing as government money, there's only taxpayers' money. That's an out and out lie. Menzies proved it from 1948 through to 1965 and he maintained budget deficits eight to nine times what we're doing today. But he did that to maintain full employment. That kept the middle classes in, in work. It grew a healthy ec economic environment. I benefited, benefited of that after Whitlam came to power with two degrees, one in zoology, one in computer science. I'm completely backgrounded in science and business. I, I have worked in the community for suicide prevention with Go and Surf Social. I've been an active member over the years with Surf Rider Foundation here locally. And my own company, uh, HBFM, rebuilt and computerised the membership and club system for the whole of Surf Life Saving Australia. Anybody here in the Surf Life Saving movement would know of Surfguard, Surf Life Saving Online. Now, that required the understanding of business, volunteers and the sport. We will fight for net zero by 2030. If you're aiming at 2050, you're aiming to cook the planet. Scientists tell us that. So vote for the planet, vote TNL. Next up is Christopher Ball from United Australia Party. Thank you, Christopher. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm probably going to be the odd man out here, but uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge everybody that's here and past and present. Um, I enjoyed the uh, United Australia Party mainly because I believe that people have personal rights and one of the first things we would like to see established taking government would be to establish a Bill of Rights, enshrining people's freedom of speech, religion and the right to choose their own medical interventions. Okay. Um, I, I also believe that uh, people who have lost their jobs through being vaccinated or not vaccinated, there are thousands of people who could have uh, and should be reinstated for their job. So I really want to get that would relieve the hospitals and what have you. Now, on, as far as, uh, as, far as uh, general policies, we have policies that I believe will work, reduce the, 20, the trillion dollar debt by ex export license on iron ore. That will uh, pay our debt down to by 20 years. Other parties are recommending up to um, uh, you know, 180 years, $10, $10 billion for the next 180 years, which is ridiculous. It's going to affect livelihoods, families, my children, my grandchildren, as far as inflation. So we need to bring that debt under, under control. Now, I also realise that, uh, probably being the odd man out, I do have a different view when it comes to climate change. I believe there is climate change, but I don't believe there is a crisis. And this is a point of debate amongst scientists. Some claim consensus, but I don't believe consensus is real science. Science is data. And the data, I believe, does not really c figure that out. I do believe there's a place for renewables, but renewals will never, ever be able to replace uh, or, or power the whole world. In fact, renewables, are, at this point in time, represent about 3% of the world's energy. Most of the world, including Europe and America and Asia, are moving towards nuclear. And their nuclear today is uh, uh, not to be confused with... Uh, Fukushima or, or uh, Chernobyl, which was 60, 70, built back in the 60s, 70s, that had virtually no um, built-in walk-away safe pr uh, processes. 
I believe if you want net zero, it's a win-win for everyone. You'll have absolute stable energy. It's clean. It's safe. We've had a reactor in our country since 1958, which all of you, me included, have enjoyed medical radiation for medical services uh, being um, x-rays, etc. So I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christopher. Next up is Dr. Sophie Scomps. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I need to stand for some reason. I'm sorry. Um, it's so wonderful to see you all here because we are reinvigorating our democracy. So it's great to have you all along and thank you so much for coming. I would like to also pay my respects to the traditional, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm Dr. Sophie Scomps and I'm running as a community independent at this election. And so my overarching ambition and aim is to represent you, to take your, your views, your values and your voice to Canberra. We have been ignored and taken for granted and neglected for way too long and our voice has been missing from the national debate. <laughs> and we absolutely deserve to have a voice. Every, every electorate deserves to be represented, including ours, and it needs to be represented genuinely. So the issues that I, the policy and the policy priorities that I'm taking down to Canberra come directly from the people of McKellar, through the voices of McKellar, through, through the report, the McKellar Matters report. These are the issues that are important to us. Cli urgent action on climate change. Yes, we need to bring back integrity and decency and trust into our politics through a federal ICAC and strengthening the, our democratic institutions as well. We need gender equality and equality on so many different scales. We see housing affordability, in, you know, inaffordability, increasing the gap between the haves and the have-nots. There are so many issues that we need to be represented on and, um, and I'm, the way that I want to do it is to continue listening. So not just listening beforehand, but if I'm lucky enough to be elected to continue to involve the community in the whole democratic process with constituent advisory bodies, with town halls like this, so that you are engaged with your democracy and you feel that the democracy is working for you. And also even just thinking about um, citizen juries as well to really get that non-biased viewpoint. So what do I bring? I bring my life experience to this. Um, I've been an emergency doctor and a doctor and a mum and, um, and an elite athlete. And it's those life experiences I'm bringing to the job. I see it, I've been looking after the community for the last 20 years or more and I see it as a step up, continuing to advocate on behalf of this community. We have some really big challenges and we need to start acting. I will act, one of the important things is, as an independent, I will be focusing on the issues, not the ideology. So we'll be working constructively, bringing that decision making back to the sensible centre, driving consensus, building relationships so that we can start moving our country forward again. We have stagnated with that adversarial two-party system and it's time to start moving forward again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And finally, Paula Goodman from the ALP. Paula. Hello there. Um, fantastic. I'm Paula Goodman. I'm representing Labor, of course. Been a Labor girl all my life. Um, I also would like to say welcome to country in terms of respect for our first peoples of this land as we sit here tonight, the Garigal and the Aora people, past, present and future. I actually worked as a teacher at the very first Aora Centre, which was in Redfern. Back in the day when it was a little bit spooky to walk around Redfern, it was very dilapidated, it was not looked after, and I had my eyes opened uh, to teaching those young people. I taught drama, dance, and a, a few social skills along the way. Um, I just want to say that, uh, I come with a lot of experience. Um, I'm an older lady, <laughs> you may have noticed, and 
I have had a world of experience, not all fantastic. Uh, I had to flee domestic violence myself in my life and thank God for the people that were around at the time to help me and for the bravery that I was given to do it at the time. Therefore, I'm a great advocate for the Women's Resilience Centre. Now, we are trying to get this built here on the northern beaches um, because you may or may not know that there are women, as we speak this evening, living in their cars. Uh, when I was um, with, with Ethan, actually, when we were doing the um, going for local government, uh, I had so many women, just, you know, two and three a day coming up to me because they knew that was one of my platforms and expressing the fact that they were either about to go and live in their car or were living in their car. That's crazy. That's crazy. There are good places here for, for women and families to go to, but they're normally chock-a-block and you have to wait. Now, a woman that's fleeing can't wait. Neither can her children. Uh, I came to the Labor Party uh, as a very young person. At the age of 14, I nicked off school to go to the moratorium in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, out of the school uniform, into my band the bomb outfit and uh, literally went and sat on Burke Street. Uh, it was an amazing time. It, young people were so invested, just like our young Ethan here, so invested in their future back then. And of course, I had friends being 14 years of age who were going off to Vietnam. Their brothers were going off to Vietnam. It was a very scary time. And um, that's when Gough made sure, the Labor Party made sure and put a stop to that ridiculous war. That's why I'm invested in Labor. They look after community. They're invested in you and our social services, Medicare just being the tip of the iceberg. I know if the Liberals get in, they are going to chip away at Medicare like you won't believe. And we need to protect it. Labor will make sure it never gets taken. Thank you. Thank you all. Look, if you're here tonight, it means you're passionate about politics and democracy. But we do have limited time, so if you're going to ask a question, please make them short and to the point. And if someone before you asks the same or a similar question, uh, please think very quickly of another one or just skip your turn. Now, this is an event for voters of McKellar, so please state your name and your suburb before asking your question. Now, we've got a, ro a roaming mic, lovely lady down there with the mic, and we'll get you to put your hands up, and we're really going to try and get a diversity of questions. I've also got questions that people, when they came at the door, wrote down on pieces of paper, so I'll read their names out and the suburb and the question on their behalf. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the questions are general questions that really apply to everybody, but we won't have time for most of those to be answered by everyone. So I'll try and spread the questions out as well um, to make sure that all of our candidates talk about something. <laughs> so I might kick off. If people want to put their hands up now who've got questions we've got and... One here, Wendy. Sorry, up here. Oh, you've got one already. Well, all right, we'll go straight to the audience rather than having me read one out. Hi, I'm John Clark. I'm from Beacon Hill. Um, this question is addressed to all but one of the candidates because you've, one of them already answered uh, my question. Uh, I'm a student of history and one, one of those things that I know is very clear from history is that when an uh, uh, emergency occurs, when a, when a period of, of uh, unrest or, or, or some kind of challenge, be it a health challenge or whatever occurs, that what a government does is it declares an emergency and then it uses its emergency powers to encroach on rights. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the problem with that is that governments are notorious at not giving them back and at taking too many in the first place. And I really feel like, personally, that's happened in 2020, in 2020 and 2021. So my question to the, uh, all the candidates, but the one who already uh, uh, affirmed that they were going to support a Bill of Rights, I want to know what, their, what the candidates' views are. Will they support a Bill of Rights? Okay, we'll start from Sophie. 
Thank you for that question. Yes, um, there's a lot of concern out there about our, our rights um, and the encroachment upon our rights. Um, I would say that we need having an independent in Parliament is really important because there's that role of holding the politicians to account and providing that oversight as well. So we're not just yes people, we're just we're looking into every piece of legislation and um, and making sure that it's in the interests of Australians. So yes, that would be something that I would definitely look at a legislation around human human rights and look further at a bill as well in the future. Thank okay, you. Okay, and um, Paula, and we'll just pass the mic on. <laughs> quadruple vexed. Um, absolutely. I think this is why ICAC is important. You know, we, we have to have people in... Thank you. Was that a small clap? Thank you. Um, it's really important we have someone uh, keeping an eye on who's keeping an eye on us and who's giving uh, the rules and regulations about what is good and what, and what is bad. We watched uh, uh, people getting away with absolute you know, the most dreadful and heinous things in Parliament and walking away. Um, a Labor Party would never have allowed that to happen. Uh, those people would have been dealt with properly. Uh, the Liberal Party literally golden handshake and out the door. Um, ICAC's really important from that perspective. Um, it's a must. Yes, Bill of Rights, absolutely important. And I think it's been obviously glaring of late because of the fact that um, there were mandates about to happen. Well, they did seminally happen uh, regarding COVID. It was a fairly confusing time for everybody. It tore apart friendships and it tore apart communities. So I do understand exactly what you're saying, sir. Okay. Thanks, Paula. And Ethan. Yes, Ethan. Bill of Rights from the Greens? Uh, I absolutely believe that we should have a Bill of Rights in this country. I think that human rights are being overlooked, uh, especially under this coalition government for the last 10 years. And I think that any Bill of Rights should also include young people and our concerns about the future. So that means I should have the right to a safe future and to a safe climate and so should the rest of the young people that are a part of my generation. I think that young people deserve the right to shelter, to be able to afford to rent or to buy their own home, because what's happened is that this government has closed the door behind them and they have made an untenable housing situation for our young people. We have been given extreme amounts of debt and we're being thrust out into the workforce and expected to be able to buy our first home. Well, unfortunately, we can't. And on the northern beaches, we've got a shortage of 8,000 affordable homes. That's the reality. And unfortunately, we've got a local member whose solution to this housing crisis is to cut the red tape and to reduce regulations for developers and let them run amok planning and building whatever they want on the northern beaches. Well, I, for one, want to see our low-rise and uh, laid-back way of life protected here on the northern beaches, because it's unacceptable that we should be forced to destroy our pristine, untouched bushland and beaches just to make profits for wealthy developers who don't deserve it. Thanks, Ethan. And um, Barry, if you could address that question as well. Oh, right, you can wipe your own mic now. <laughs> Avoid it like the plague, they said, and then COVID came. Um, TNL have a Bill of Rights policy, and I've got to admit I'm not the expert. It was developed by our, um, our lawyer folk in the, in, in the um, party. But, yes, I don't think it's a Bill of Rights that you're necessarily asking for, sir. Um, we absolutely support health advice being implemented to protect everybody. The problem with being an individual in a society is you're in a society of social animals. We are a social animal. We have been for four million years. So we have to work at the, at the, at the level of society and community. But anyway, um, quickly, we, we, our Bill of Rights will enshrine the protection of whistleblowers. 
Uh, it'll enshrine the right to life and the right to end of life. It will... Um, it also the right to the integrity of the person. So that means that basically your information must be stored as if it's your life depends on it because it does in the future. Uh, and the right to liberty and security. So we believe in a free society, but we believe in a secure society. We don't accept this current overarching sort of authoritarian neoconservative model that we're being dished up from the Liberal Party. Um, we want to see an open, accepting, tolerant society and our Bill of Rights would also, by the way, um, reduce the voting age to 16 so your young folks get a vote and what their future looks like. I, look, I cannot explain the whole Bill of Rights myself so I'm happy if anyone wants to see the detail I can refer you to the folks that wrote it. Great. Thanks, Barry. Um, now I'll read out one of the questions that came in earlier and we, we have got... Uh, a, lot, a couple of questions that we'll, I'll direct to specific people on, on the panel. Um, but I think this one is one, uh, one that a lot of people might want to know the answer to. And this is directed to Sophie. And this is from Charles MacDonald at Avalon Beach. So Sophie, in the event of a hung parliament, is your inclination towards Labor Greens or the Liberal Nationals? I need the answer before I vote and you owe it to the electorate to be totally transparent. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I knew that one was coming. Um, so if and when a negotiation happens, what I will be doing is going into bat for the people of this community, for us. We have been ignored and neglected for way too long. So that's the number one priority. And I will be standing strong on those issues that are important to us. So um, I, like every other Australian, yes, I want to know what they're going to bring me to offer, but I don't know that. They haven't even completely articulated their policies. So I, like the rest of you, I need to wait. And when they, you know, wait to see what they offer, they offer the people of McKellar and the rest of Australia as well. And that will be action. My, the policies I'm taking are crystal clear. You know what you're voting for. They've come from the people. It's urgent action on climate change with a legislated 2050 target. There's a 50% 2030 uh, carbon emissions target as well, in line with the science and in line with the Business Council of Australia. There's a Federal Integrity Commission. So, and they, they, you know, they're, they're the most important things, as we saw up on the McKellar Matters as well. So that's what I'll be standing strong on, and I look forward to see what they bring me. Thank you. Now, we'll take another question from the floor. And my eyesight's not the best. I'm trying to... Um, we've had a man. Well, let's get a woman. Young person. Oh. A young woman, even better. Hi, my name's Kira. I'm from the um, North Narrowing. I already wrote down my question, but I thought I'd just ask it anyway. So I'm really concerned about the cost of living crisis, and I think that there's two ways you can look at it. We can either look at the inflation, which is a bit hard to address because there's a lot of international issues that we can't really fix, or we look at wages, which are really, really stagnated and are actually going backwards at the moment. So I feel like I kind of know with the Labor and the Greens, but I was just wondering for you guys, how would you vote if policies to increase wages came up, for example, increasing awards above inflation rate or increasing um, unions. Thank okay. you. Okay, so I've the question's the essentially about <laughs> award rates and whether you'd be pushing for those to go higher. Um, I, 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 yeah, I might just say, well, I think we all want to answer that one, don't we? <laughs> well, all right, so why don't we do that? Because okay. I think that is the kind of, and we might start from this end, Sophie, with Christopher. Okay, um, I'll be honest, I'm not too sure. Um, I do believe we have policies that will increase the living standards. Uh, but as far as legislating uh, wage increase, I do believe people should have a fair and viable increase. But our policies are more aimed at improving life standards, bringing the debt down by paying off the trillion dollars worth of debt, which most people don't realise this there's a tsunami of actual debt coming and it will affect everyone's life from your groceries to your petrol. So we can contribute definitely by bringing that down. We want to bring a trillion dollars worth of uh, 
super back into Australia to invest in Australia to create more jobs. And um, my view is, without giving it too much thought, we want to create more prosperity through policies that will create wealth and reduce taxation. That's the best I can do. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Barry. Thank you very much for that question. It's a brilliant question. Um, cost of living currently, as we know, has been driven by inflation. Most of that inflation here in Australia has been driven by a 40% increase in the price of coal, driving power stations in Queensland, and outrageous increase in diesel fuel or oil prices uh, as a result of the Russian war. Also, we've had all manner of supply chain issues affect supply chain over COVID so that we have a situation where in 2019 a container from Japan to America was roughly about $2,000 a trip. It's currently $13,000 a trip. And there's no regulations monitoring that gouging. The, the billionaires of this planet have, become, have doubled their wealth at least in the last two years. So what TNL proposes is first, interest rates aren't going to solve this problem because it's not a problem of money. It's a problem of supply chain. So what we need, what we will do, is we will work to reduce the 235% of GDP at his private debt at the moment. The government debt is almost insignificant at the moment compared to private debt. And the private sector can go broke. The government can't. So what we would do is we will pay a we will move to a living wage and that will be the basic wage as a part of a job guarantee system that we will implement to, impl to bring that full employment target that I spoke about. Um, for those of you who may not have been familiar with modern monetary theory, these are um, ideas that have been around for years. There's uh, Pavlina Chernova from Germany, uh, Bill Mitchell from up the road at Newcastle and the Centre for Future Employment, and of course our own Professor Stephen Keane have written on it extensively. So we would address the causes um, of, and the causes are not government spending. The causes of inflation and the cost of raise, cost, cost of living right now is exactly driven by property madness. Um, if anyone's, have anyone read the book called The Game of Mates? If you haven't, you should. It is one of the most illuminating books on the way money works in Australia. So we would seek to actually have a regulated market, not an open free-for-all neo-liberal um, market where millionaires become billionaires, the working class become the working, the insecure working poor, and we've lost the middle class. So that's how we'd address it. We wouldn't be looking to raise interest rates because what that'll do is just stop economic activity and bring about well, God knows what. Last time they did that was in the 1920s and we ended up with the Great Depression. Okay. So we're, we need to watch what we do. Thanks, Barry. And um, Ethan. Thank you for your question. Uh, so not only do we have a climate crisis, a housing crisis, an inequality crisis, but we've also got a cost of living crisis. And it just seems like regular, hard-working Australians can't catch a break under the Morrison government and under the last 10 years of a Liberal National Coalition government. So what are the Greens going to do about it? Well, th what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the cost of the essential services that every Australian should be able to access. So that means free and accessible childcare. We'll increase the minimum wage and we'll include dental and mental health under Medicare. In addition to that, we'll raise all income support payments to at least $88 a day above the poverty line. We'll wipe all outstanding student hex debt and we'll make education free, free university and free TAFE so that everyone in this country can access a free preschool to PhD education. Australia has never been wealthier We've got the expertise and we've got the ability to do it. If Scott Morrison can go to university for free, then why shouldn't our generation? Thank you. Paula, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to bring it back to McKellar. Okay, so here's the thing. Social services, you know, Medicare, all of those things are, are a labour initiative. Labor 
is, is there for us to support us. And I believe that this Liberal government have forced this incredible uh, scenario where we are paying through the tooth for everything. I believe they are responsible for that. And I don't think that would have happened. In fact, I know that wouldn't have happened under a Labor government. We agree in terms of uh, free education. Gough did it way back then, right? Look what it did for the people of every single community. I had a friend, he happened to be at the boys' home. He was an orphan. He lived at the boys' home down the road from our family. He used to hang out with us because we accepted him as a member of our family. He is now one of the leading barristers in Victoria because he had free education. It opened up a wonderful opportunity for people who can't afford that to, to make something of themselves. And it gives people, you know, you're, you're seeing people across the board, you know, specialist doctors, barristers, lawyers, dentists that haven't been born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They're real people and they understand you as a, as a part of the community. It's really important. And uh, the other thing is with the free education, um, you know, you have to look at, OK, aged care. I know we are going to be looking at childcare and we've already put our platform out for that to make sure that um, we're not paying ridiculous amounts of money so that one wage is going down the drain in paying for childcare. We also want to make sure that there are more nurses, trained nurses, in our nursing homes. Now, I say this from the point of view of experience. Um, I've worked in aged care. It's not a pretty sight. Um, and we need people in there that know what they're doing. I wouldn't have wanted my parents in aged care the way it's being run at the moment. That's got to be sorted. It's already, you know, this government have been told what needs to be done. Have they done it? No. It's immoral absolutely immoral, dragging old people out of their beds at five o'clock in the morning to be showered because the poor nurse has got to do six people be before nine o'clock. You know, whether they like it or not, they get dragged out of bed. You know, it's, it's, it's not a pretty sight. And I won't go into all the hideous things I know, but please keep that in mind when you go to vote. Thank you. So, Sophie. Do we need higher wages? And if we do, how would you do it? Uh, yes, so we have, I, I, look, I totally agree. I think the young people in Australia are totally up against it at the moment with housing inaffordability, rising cost of living, climate change. There's a mental health crisis on the northern beaches and across the country. You can't get the services you need if you've got a mental health issue. You're up against it and there's no wonder that the young people feel that they're shut out, cut off and they're not being heard because that's the way it has actually been. And so what we need to do is we need to bring people back into their democracy and start listening to the young people and all people who are affected by the cost of living. I'd say with wages, we can start with raising the wages, which we were talking about, with, with the aged care workers. They're stressed out. I mean, you can, you can earn more money pulling beers at the local pub than you get looking after our elderly people and vulnerable people. The nurses are striking, and they're striking for a reason. They don't feel that they can provide the care that's necessary for their patients. That's telling us something, and that they're burnt out and stressed. They're leaving in hordes. And so they're saying but by, that by 2025, we will have a def deficit of nurses across Australia of 110,000. So we really do need to start looking at how we value these services as well. Um, so they're just two examples. Um, and also talking about the cost of living, there's so many things that could have been done and that we can do now to help bring down the cost of living. And a lot of them have been like, a, you know, the, the coalition government has been a handbrake on things. One of them is the fact that we can reduce electricity prices for households, businesses, industry by investing in renewables. Renewable energy is cheaper and that's just a fact. You know, we know that. <laughs> So, so cheaper electricity for households is a no-brainer. And actually, if we had 
encouraged electric vehicles in this country as well, we would not be beholden to the foreign oil prices either. Um, I, yep. And then childcare um, is so important, that age three to five years old, you know, that we need to put, have universal access to affordable childcare so that our children can get their best start in life and so that parents can also go back to work if they choose to do so. So that will also help the cost of living. Every dollar invested into childcare brings back two dollars in the GDP. So it's a no-brainer as well. There's so much that we can be doing to help people that's not being done currently. Thank you very much, Sophie. Now, I know there's some questions from the floor, but I'll take another one from the questions that came in earlier, and it might address some of the ones, because we've got a lot of questions here on housing affordability, uh, and we've also got one on interest rates, which I'll direct to Christopher, um, and I think the question is directed to Christopher, it's from Ian in Avalon. So the United Australia Party's got a policy at the moment that's been heavily promoted to keep interest rates at, I think, a maximum of 3%. How can this be done when we've got an independent RBA and that's independent through legislation? That's a good question and I'll try and answer it. Um, <clears throat> basically, all the banks are controlled by an Act of Parliament and before the banks were deregulated during Federation for many, many years prior to deregulation, the government controlled the interest rate. But then when the interest rates were freed up, and the banks became independent. So from what I've been told by uh, people who are very well schooled in the business, that it can be done legally by passing an Act of Parliament. And it would be considered a, an emergency act because of the most people aren't aware of the interest rates that are just skyrocketing overseas. We're pretty sheltered at the moment, but the next year or two, we're going to see massive defaults on homes, and uh, that affects businesses, that affects families, that affects people being depressed, committing suicide. It's not a pretty picture. There is a tsunami of debt that has to be addressed. And so our policy on reducing or capping home prices or home, it's only on home, home loans, it's not on other interest rates, it would save your home because if you lose your home, whether you believe in climate change extremism or climate change uh, uh, moderatism, losing your home is probably the most important thing to keep your home and that's what we want to do. Oh, another spam call. Um, so that's, it can be done. It was done before the banks were deregulated. It would be introduced as an emergency process to save people's homes. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Just uh, I think we'll take a question from the floor. The gentleman here, uh, Catherine, right down here at the front. My name's John Barraclough, I'm from Collaroy. If freedom of opportunity is to be a birthright, which we're all referring to in various ways, that means great education, great health care, and great support. My question's simple, what's the role of taxation in achieving it, particularly after the COVID debt? Okay, so we might direct that one to Barry. As I said earlier, um, I'm a proponent of modern monetary theory. And modern monetary theory suggests or says that in, in Australia there's only one organisation that's allowed to issue new dollars. That's called the Australian Government. It does it through the Reserve Bank. Um, <laughs> Interest tax is charged from the government after it's, after it's spent its money. And the reason it does that is to control inflation and to make sure that everybody uses the dollar. Because if you're, gonna, if you're going to earn any wage or any income from trade or whatever in Australia, you must pay your tax in Australian dollars. They don't, now, those dollars don't pay government spending for government spending. What they do is give headroom to be able to even the spending across the economy so that we can get better results across the economy. So, for example, we would completely support 
taxing very large organisations, billionaires and those sorts of things to ensure that those at the lo lower end are able to get the government spending that we need to keep them employed but to maintain control over inflation at the same time. And that's one of the beauties of the job guarantee system. It acts as a negative feedback loop. And if anyone understand, if you understand biology, and negative feedback loops are the things that keep the world active and alive. What happens in neoliberal, techno, neoliberal models is they have a positive feedback loop, and that positive feedback loop has fed debt, private debt, for decades, and we need to break that cycle. So taxation to me is important. It, regulates the amount of money in the economy so that it doesn't overheat and it also can be used to guide behaviour. So, for example, taxing carbon pollution is a great idea because it, it, def it makes people not do that. So those sorts, that, that's the role, as I see it, of tax. It's to maintain a, a, a level of inflation and it's also to uh, ensure we get the results we want uh, as a community and a society. So tax is extremely important. Deficits are important, but generally not for the reasons we're told. Thanks, Barry. Um, I'll direct another question uh, that came in earlier, and I'll be a bit cheeky, because I know this has come up in the news recently, so I'll direct this one to Paula from the ALP. This is from Phil Jones in Eleonora Heights. Phil asks, will you work to abolish temporary protection visas for asylum seekers in Australia, and will you work to get the refugees who are stuck in PG back to Australia? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> That's the easy answer. I think uh, the whole refugee question has been fairly diabolical. Um, and I also uh, believe that one of the important factors in uh, getting people working again and getting decent nursing staff and getting decent doctors and having those areas filled where we're so lacking will be making, making it easier for people to come into this country to work. Um, you've probably heard a lot of Irish voices uh, over the years in hospital systems. Well, we should be hearing more of them. Also, um, I think that uh, with what's happening now, uh, we also need to make sure that the Pacific island areas are able to come to Australia on a working, a, a much more pliable working scenario. That's really important. We're going to need that going forward. Because um, I think, you know, th this is the stuff that needs to be, it should have been done and dusted ages ago, you know, and it's still a problem. We, we need those people. We need to be supporting them. What we've done um, of late uh, with this uh, complete neglect um, of Samoa with this complete neglect of that particular area, the Pacific Islands in general. Those people have been part of our workforce for as long as I can remember. And now it's so difficult for them to get here. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and now we've got a scenario where we're spending five zillion dollars on, 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 on um, sh uh, what are they called? Underwater ships, darling, submarine. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> Submarine. Thank God for the young. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I think, you know, that, that's, that's just nuts. Uh, and, and to upset those very people whose coast, coastal areas... You know, my, my uncle, my parents, my great-grandfather went to war to protect our coast. Now we don't even really have a very defined area of... of um, a combatant in our country if something goes wrong and we're going to have the Chinese not too far away. How the hell did that happen? How did it happen? <laughs> neglect. Thank you. In one word, neglect. Anyway, thank you for the question. I hope that's helped. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, now we're going back to the floor. We've got a question from this lady down here. And state your name and your suburb. Okay. My name's Janine Burdew. I'm from Mona Vale. I'd like to ask, this is a bit of a different question, uh, the candidates about uh, the funding of the ABC and the defunding that's happened over the last 10 years by the Liberals and would they be in favour of bringing back that funding, especially Dr Scumps? Oh, okay. yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. All right, so oh. I'll start at that end but we'll give everyone a response, so really quick. No speeches yes. about 
oh. you know, the past, just will no. you increase yes, the funding? Yes, 100% support the ABC. A strong democracy needs a scrutiny and it needs to be held to account. Our politicians need to be held to account and the ABC and our public broadcasters have a vital role in doing that. And the fact that it's been progressively defunded is, is shameful, I think. Yes, thank you. And, and um, absolute detail. I mean, just harking back quickly to, to the island scenario, the Pacific Islands, they had our ABC. We were very connected to them because they had our ABC. And they don't anymore. Or they have very, very tiny bits of it. And that, that's wrong on so many levels, I can't begin to tell you. ABC is an integral part of our life in Australia. It keeps us connected. It's unbiased, I believe. It's unbiased. Um, and, I, and I think they've got the best comedy shows on the world. I love them. Thanks, Thank Paula. You. Ethan. Thanks for the question. The Greens will definitely reinvest the money that the ABC needs because, of course, it's such a vital part of our democracy and it's absolutely shameful what the coalition government has done to Auntie. It's absolutely appalling. So the Greens will strengthen it and we'll make sure that the ABC will never be able to have their funding touched again to proliferate the far right and the disgusting views of the coalition government. Thank you. Barry, more money for the ABC? Uh, TNL is completely committed to refunding the ABC. It's an essential, essential part of our Australian life. I can remember sitting on a 14-foot open tinny out of the side of land, out in the barrier reef. The one station we always looked for was the ABC because it told us whether or not we're going to get blown away. <laughs> this, yeah. We will also ensure the independence of the ABC board because it's not just important who decides what goes on TV, it's important who decides who decides what goes on TV. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Christopher. <laughs> well, we all realise that most of our news feeds come from central places. There's probably two or three places. Reuters is one of them. That's why if you could look at every TV station, they're all basically saying the same thing. And uh, so I believe our news is very much filtered as to what, what people want to hear. So the other thing I want to say is that I... I do believe that the ABC is more skewed to the left. Um, that's my view. Sorry. That's all my right, view. All right, bit of respect for our candidate, That's my please. view. Um, but I do believe they have a very good role, a very important role, but I would like to see more balance in their reporting uh, because uh, I won't go into it, but there are places where I think, where are some of the other candidates? Where it's, it's like a two-horse race in some of their reporting. Um, some of their filtering of information. I just, honestly, I feel it needs to be shaken up a bit. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> OK, we've got uh, another question um, that came in earlier, and this is from Jenny Wellings from Collaroy. And Jenny asked, and, and I'll address this to all of you, but really short answers, because it's an easy question. Uh, beyond the issue of climate change, to clarify my vote, I would like to know where each of your preferences will be placed. So we'll start at this end with Christopher. Preferences, United Australia Party? Reference? Preferences. Our oh, preferences, so. are, that's top secret. No, I'm only joking. Um, at this point, we're supporting people who we consider are freedom fighters, people who've stood up for personal choice in medical vaccination. vaccination. <laughs> Um, so, I would have to say at the top of my head, we'd probably support uh, the One Nation Party, would be our first preference. That is my personal view, okay? That's not necessarily the way the party's going to do it, because I believe every state is different when it comes to preferences. It's all about jockeying for the maximum of, uh, to get re-elected. In fact, there are other parties where, in fact, you might be interested, the Liberal Labor in Western Australia are preferencing each other. And that, that's a first, where Liberal and Labor are preferencing people. And I believe it's also the Queensland. So it, there's a real battle on preferencing. So I suppose off the top of my head personally, One Nation, uh, that's... Thank you. OK, thanks, Christopher. Barry. At, at, at a national level, TNL has, 
has suggested to people, you vote the way you want to, just vote for us first. Locally though, and we're working out our preferences seat by seat. So what we're looking at are the people that are closest to our policies. So that probably goes, the young fellow beside me, the lady at the other end, Paula. <laughs> I don't know where you come. <laughs> Polinsky's last. <laughs> And Ethan, can I ask, uh, Barry raised a good point. Um, in some cases, um, it, it's going to differ from seat to seat, so you might want to say, Ethan, what the situation will be in McKellar. Barry? No, Ethan. Yeah, I'll just say it. good? Yeah, yeah. So, as Adam Bant, leader of the Greens, said the other day, uh, across the country, the Greens will be preferencing Labor above the Liberals. And he's also stated that the Greens will have preferences for climate-focused independence at the top of their ballot. Now, definitely, Liberals should be at the bottom end of your ballot, and I guess it's up to the voter to decide which candidate and which party ends up getting that beautiful last preference vote, because it really is a race to the bottom uh, for some of the other parties that have decided to run in this seat. But, of course, it's up to the voter to allocate their own preferences but the Greens are recommending that you preference independence and Labor above the Liberals and above other right-wing parties and candidates. Thank you. Um, I have to say, because we are very, um, you know, we have climate change right at the top of our list and it's extremely important. Um, so we have preferenced the Doctor and the Greens. And um, we, we again have uh, put those other people right down the bottom. Right, you'll have to go looking for them. Okay. Um, main thing, I just want to quickly say, sorry, Chris Bowen made an announcement a couple of weeks ago. He actually rang me. We are putting in uh, these massive batteries, uh, community batteries, if we, get, uh, if we form government, massive batteries for Warrywood and across McKellar. Sophie. Um, I like that idea. When, when we had our sustainability group, we were fighting for community batteries. So um, as a community, well, as an independent, what we're asking for, what I'm asking for is that you put one, me one, and then you choose who you would like to preference. But you will need to fill in every single box, one to seven. There's seven candidates this time. Um, yes, yeah, so, but you get to choose how you'd like to preference. Thanks very much. And we'll take a question from the floor. Where is... Oh, we'll just... Come. We've had none at the back here, so I'm just trying to get a room equity as well. Oh, OK. So I've got a uh, You'll man be up next. the back. <laughs> OK, we've got a question from the back. Thank you. Um, we've heard a little bit about... So uh, can you just say your name and what oh, suburb you're from? I'm Brendan from Collaroy. Oh, hang on, I recognise that voice. <laughs> Brendan Donoghue, uh, everyone, Surf Rider Foundation. Yeah, we've heard a bit about... Um, protection of the coast, we, we come at it from a different angle um, and it's not a right angle. Um, what we're seeing down at Collaroy is vandalism writ large. <laughs> We've had concrete and, and right angles for a long time now and that sort of proposal has been knocked back on many occasions in many different areas around Australia. What's happened is the legislation's changed, thanks to the LMP at a state level, and they have kicked this problem out of their basket downstairs to local government. Brendan, what is your question? My question is, would the panellists support federal intervention into coastal issues? This is a massive problem. Some of these properties will definitely need to be bought back. We don't mind them saving their houses at this stage. We've got a real problem with them saving every square inch of their front yard. OK, so you didn't direct that to anyone in particular, did you? So, Ethan, do you want to kick that off? Thank you for that question. Uh, and as Paula would know, during uh, our council race, I was very outspoken about the Narrabeen Collaroy Seawall because not only is it an appalling use of the community's funds, to protect the few vested interests of the wealthy, but it's an absolute uh, disgrace to uh, cut off access to a public beach and then install staircases on the side of the wall 
so that, don't worry, even if you can't do it, the rich people who have built the wall will be all fine to get down to the beach. So I had a great press um, release with, Adam, uh, with David Shoebridge, who was the Green Senate candidate for New South Wales. And what we'll be doing with regard to the seawall is we'll create a coastal commissioner. And that coastal commissioner will be able to assess every DA of that scale and will be able to either override or amend it to make sure that it's in the best interest of the beach, of the environment, and of the wider community. So that's what we'll do as Greens. And yes, I would support federal intervention uh, regarding the seawall because this can't become our standard approach to coastal erosion and sea level rise, to put a massive concrete wall on every beach up the coast. Thank you. Thanks. I think we've got another question down the back. Can Thanks, I, can Catherine. Can quickly add to that? No, no. <laughs> no, Paula, we've got another question from someone down the back. Uh, we really, we we're going to run out of time soon, so Ethan hadn't had his own question. That, that was one of them. So we'll have this lady down here. Hi, my name is Eva Milan. I'm from Clareville. I'd like to ask a question with respect to the bill that Zali Stegall attempted to introduce into Parliament not so long ago, and that was a bill outlawing lies in political advertising. I would like to know... Um, what you would like to do about that and if there's anyone sitting up here on the stage at this moment who thinks that that's okay? No, it's not okay. Thank you for that great question. Um, I'll just quickly say, so we've all got a chance to say something. Um, the, I, I'm one of four girls in my family and mum always came to me if she wanted the truth um, because I was the only one that would go, she knocked the lamp over, it wasn't me. Um, here's the thing. Lies um, are, are at a, a pandemic thing all around the world. You, you, you know, we had Trump for too long. Just lie, lie, lie. That's still going on. You can't... I don't think there's anything you can do to stop it because where there's money and lots of it, there's going to be lies. And people tend to read that stuff and the people, not like you people, who are actually invested in, in McKellar, good on you, champions... But the people who read that stuff, and because it's in print or it's on the telly, they go, oh, that must be, that must be real. I've worked in television. I've worked in television for 30 years. Most of it is not real. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think... I think that, you know, it's, it's, the horse has bolted on that one. I'd love to think it could be fixed, but I don't think it can. OK, Sophie, truth, oh. in, truth in, in political say, advertising, how yes, do we deal 100 with that? 100% support that. It's a no-brainer, a complete no-brainer. Um, yeah. And um, along with that, I mean, the corporations, there are, there are you know, there's, there's laws against lying in advertising and why doesn't it apply to our highest level of our, you know, leadership? It's, it's unbelievable. But also, just also, we also need donation reform and we also need that federal ICAC so that we can start to trust our government again. Thank you. Ethan. Ethan, would you... Oh, Barry's got it. Barry's got the floor. Of course, lying in any public forum should be illegal. Um, we will work... Part of what our proposal, I told you before, is to, re is to fund the ABC, and that would help fund information gathering. There's this thing called data science, so we can actually test these hypotheses these days. So I think that we should be able to set up a way to actually ensure that those lies are are caught. They're not at the moment, because if they sail through, but I absolutely agree that we should Lying in public should be banned anyway. OK, thanks. Let's go to Christopher on that question. OK, I only just comprehended the question because I couldn't hear you. Um, obviously, people should tell the truth, but I think there is also a danger of people trying to tell other people what the truth is. Uh, that leads to labelling. A lot of people are called la the label with... Uh, you know, you're a this denier or you're a that denier or you're an anti this. And really it comes down to uh, labelling, which I think can be care uh, very quite dangerous. So I do believe in freedom of speech and I believe people should have the right to say things but not to lie. And uh, we're all adults. When you listen and you hear things, we make our own mind up. We have our mind where we can say, well, that person is clearly not telling the truth. And that's what freedom's about, making your own mind, not having somebody tell you what, what is true and what is not. 
That's my view. All right, thanks, Christopher. And Ethan. Ethan, um, truth in political advertising? Yes, definitely support that one. And I think all you have to do is really look at the younger generation who have grown up with social media. And when you see that a generation hasn't been given one or two newspapers that give them their news and their political information, you see this explosion of democracy where the Greens are the primary vote of uh, young people aged 18 to 25. So of course the Greens will always support truth in political advertising because for too long we've let those in power get away with lying straight to our faces and then turning around in Parliament and voting in their own interests and in the interests of their donors and of their party. So thank you. Thanks, Ethan. <laughs> Catherine, we've got a question down here. This gentleman. Hello. My name's Jonathan King from Avalon Beach. Question for Dr Sophie. Um, some voters doubt the power of independence, right? But does Dr Sophie think that she could actually team up with other independents like Sally Stegall, Helen Haynes, Andrew Wilkie, etc., to force action on climate change and therefore have enough power to create overdue legislation to stop the fossil fuel sponsored Libs and Labor Party from burning the coal that's killing Australia and the world, especially in a hung parliament. So, so Jonathan, so, so the question was, would independents team up together? Uh, and I guess get action on climate change. Look, I would say if, if we, if one or two, sorry, if two or three more independents are elected, then the whole culture in, and the decision making in Canberra changes. It comes from the fringes in the hands of Barnaby Joyce, where the power to make decisions about climate policy currently lies, and it comes to the sensible common sense centre. And the thing is, it's not just the independents. What's happening is the independents are representing the people of Australia. The people of Australia want urgent action on climate change. So it is that sort of imperative that is driving the independent movement. And particularly here, when we listen to the people of McKellar, that's what people want, urgent action on climate change. And I'll be standing strong for urgent action on climate change, 100%. And I think that, you know, as you know, that's a similar are very similar issues for other independents as well because it's coming from their communities. Thanks, Sophie. And we've got another question on the floor. My name's Robin. I live in Avalon. I've got a question for Paula. If Labor uh, gets into minority government and our representative, our McKellar representative, is either Sophie or Ethan, is there anything you can see in Labor policy which could not accommodate their priorities and their views? Thank you for that. I think that's what you're asking is, would I support their policies if we were in a min minority scenario? I definitely would. Um, we don't want coal. Labor has got a, a fantastic um, climate change action policy. Um, I would ask you all to read it. It's, it's online. It's very uh, detailed. Um, we certainly want to see all of that stuff absolutely gone uh, in, in, a, in a timely manner, but still reaching what we need to get to. And um, if the only way of doing that is supporting um, policy action there, of course we would, yes. Is that clear? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Um, I've got a question now that I'll direct to everybody on the panel, and it's something that uh, a lot of us are probably thinking about. This is a question from David, who sadly didn't tell us what suburb he's from. Um, David asks, what is your attitude to China's security agreement with the Solomon Islands? What would you do to improve Australia's defence capability? And I'll start at this end with Christopher. So the question's about defence capability? Well, are you worried about China's deal with the Solomon Islands? And supplementary question, I guess, if you are, what are we going to do about our defence capability? Uh, well, there's not much you can do about it in, in a real direct way. That, I mean, I'm no defence expert. Um, obviously, it's a concern for a lot of Australians to have a emerging superpower literally 2,000 kilometres from your border. Um, 
they've sort of said that they won't be having um, a military base. Look, it, it is, a, it is a, an area of concern. I really don't know much more. As I do believe that Australia um, needs to be more self-sufficient in everything, including defence. Um, I, I'm aghast that uh, our, most of our oil supply comes from Singapore, most of the refining, and we've got probably, third, uh, don't, don't quote me, two to three months of fuel to run all of Australia. With that stopped, you'd have blackouts, you'd have hospitals closing down, you'd have trucks stopping. So we have very badly let our supply become exposed. So that needs to be fixed. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm no defence but obviously we, I suppose the general answer is we need to be more self-reliant for our energy and for our defence. Okay, thanks. Um, Barry. China and the Solomon Islands. What amazes me is we've got a government that leased the Darwin port to, to China and then, and then when COVID hit, picked a fight with China. I don't understand it at all. Honestly... The Solomon Islands is a sovereign nation. They're legally able to make whatever decisions they want. Yes, it's concerning that China is building a military, or potentially, they're not necessarily building a military complex there. It is concerning, but we need better international representation than we've got. I'm not a defence expert, I'm not even going there, but if I, if I have to, if you want me to, I'll go and talk to our senior policy advisors. We don't have a set policy in that area that I know of. Um, but as I say, we would not have rented Darwin to China. We would not have picked a fight with China over the COVID okay. pandemic. And we would have looked after our neighbours. I think everyone should look after their neighbours. Ethan. Well, I definitely agree with you that we've really got to reduce our dependence on foreign energy and foreign oil, which is why, of course, we've got to have a rapid transition to net zero and to having <laughs> renewable energy powering our nation because not but only... Ethan, Ethan, the question is about China and, and the Solomon I'm Islands. I'm getting there, I promise. So um, <laughs> what, what, what's the green stance on that arrangement? Are you worried about it? Is, you know... Well, I think everyone's worried about it. I mean, the Morrison government has dropped the ball when it comes to our nation's security and when it comes to the Solomon Islands. And what we've really got to do as a wealthy nation situated in the Pacific We've got to increase our foreign aid and we've got to show, that our, we've got to show our Pacific neighbours that we're willing to work with them as we move further and deeper into the climate crisis because they're the ones that are going to be affected first and foremost. And if, I mean, Fortress Australia works really well until it blows up right in our faces. So unless we work with our Pacific neighbours, increase our foreign aid and understand that this threat isn't going away and that we're actually going to have to deal with it at some point, that's when we can start having real genuine discussion about how we move forward as a nation and how we move forward as a Pacific. Thanks, Ethan. We're fast running out of time, so Paula... Um, um, yes, I'd just like to say we should never have picked a fight with China in the first place. Bad move, bad move. Um, also, just very quickly, the Pacific area are our neighbours. They should have totally been looked after. Uh, they had all, their, uh, all the um, monies that we were giving them got withdrawn under this government. All the support got withdrawn. Not all it, they got left with a tiny bit. And that's crazy. You know, what, what government does that to people who are our neighbours? Nuts. Labor would never have allowed that to happen. And finally, Sophie. So, um, I believe it's a massive failure on behalf of the coalition. Um, uh, for, for a party that's supposed to be strong on security, this is a massive failure because it's happened over more than just... It hasn't just popped up, it's happened over a de you know, more than a decade. The Abbott government cut the guts out of foreign aid spending. They had to look elsewhere. The Pacific had to look elsewhere for support. We treated them in a very um, disdainful and, and patronising way, you know, that joke about water lapping at their feet because of climate change. We had leaders of Pacific nations in tears beseeching our own leader to, to please help them and please act on climate change because they're going to lose their homes, their islands. Um, and their heritage completely. So it is a massive failure. And like we said, 
The Darwin port, the New Newcastle port's going to be need to be bought back as well. Um, and so it's what I would say it's a failure of vision. And that's the problem with the current government is it's all short term vision. Let's just cut this, but they don't see how the, what the ramifications are going to be down the line. They could have seen this coming, even the ABC being cut from the Pacific Islands as well. So anyway, it's a, it's a failure of policy. Thanks, Sophie. I am afraid we are out of time. So I want to thank every, all the candidates for turning out tonight um, and doing a stellar job in answering your questions. And thank you to the audience. We've clearly got a very engaged and energetic voting public here in McKellar. So it's great to see so many people here asking fantastic questions. Um, we invite everybody to stay for a chat and a bit of networking. I think we've got the room until nine o'clock. And also, if you want to hear all of this again or you want to tell your friends about it, I'll do a little plug to say that Radio Northern Beaches will be broadcasting this session at 1 p.m. on Thursday and again on Saturday at 3 p.m. And that's Radio Northern Beaches, 88.7, 90.3 FM. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, candidates. Don't move. Over to Nigel Howard from Northern Beaches Climate Action Network for some closing remarks. Oh my God. Northern Beaches Climate Action Network has become grown up. Look at this, so professional. Um, I don't like to work off a script. I'm better if I don't, but Marie will kill me if I go, if I don't stick to it. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, it's not often I get the last word, so I'm really going to make the most of it this evening. So how many of you have heard of the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network? Hands up. Oh my god, that's awesome, fantastic. So how many of, um, so the Northern, for those who don't know, Northern Beaches Climate Action Network is an informal um, network of climate active groups up and down the Northern Beaches. So how many of these groups do you think we have on the Northern Beaches? More than five? Put your hands up if it's more than five. More than 10? More than 20? More than 30? More than 40? More than 50? It should be more than that. It's 47. There are 47 climate active groups. Now, I was getting a bit worried hearing all the Q&A since this is hosted by Northern Beaches Climate Action Network and Voices of McKellar because it took an hour into the questions before we got any on climate change. So I'm relieved that we got there in the end. Um, but we did want this forum to cover the full breadth of issues and you certainly did that and our candidates did a great job of answering the questions. So thank you, everybody. Now, what we say about Northern Beaches Climate Action Network is not that it's non-partisan. We don't say we're non-partisan. We say we're polypartisan. That means that everybody, every political persuasion, has their voice in the Northern Beaches Climate Action Network, and you're all invited to come and say things even when we disagree with them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got a permanent invite, Chris. Um, so uh, what are we? Well, we're not just another organisation. We're a network of organisations. So we have no money, we have no board, um, and we organise around a Facebook page where we coordinate the activities of lots of groups. We do that where an individual group hasn't got the firepower or feels conflicted to cover a breadth of issues like we're covering today. So we have our role. Um, you'd enjoy our meetings because anyone who turns up can speak, but nobody can speak more than three minutes. And where's Joy? She's got her bell and she's fearsome with it. If you go over three minutes, you're out. <laughs> now, I want to thank the organising crew for these candidate forums because everyone has worked really hard to put this, everyone, put this together. So everyone's sporting a, an I Love Northern Beaches uh, T-shirt. Um, if they're lingering by the bar, buy them a drink, because they work really hard to bring this event for you.
And I especially want to thank Mary Nutt um, over here. Big, big clap for her. Because normally Northern Beaches Climate Action Networks are quite hokey, really. They're quite fun, but they're hokey. But this one's super professional because of Mary. And we want to do the same in Warringah on the 12th. Um, next, I want to thank the most important people here. That is all of you. Because every three years, politicians remember that we exist and suddenly need our votes, and suddenly they want to court us uh, to vote for them. So enjoy these few weeks where uh, they're listening to what we have to say. Next, and largely, I want to thank the candidates, firstly, for being brave enough to nominate, and braver again to be accountable to the electorate here. Lastly, and certainly not leastly, I want to uh, thank Wendy Frew, if she'd like to come back up again. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Mary. Yes, yes, you. And we'd like to uh, give you this little gift, Wendy, thanking you for your excellent and brilliant moderation. And if you all enjoyed that as much as me, then, Wendy, get ready to receive that call from uh, ABC to get you to host Q&A. Coming soon. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I think that most of our candidates are going to stay to answer those burning questions that we couldn't get in to fit into the programme. And Voices of Meg Keller and MB Can have set up round the back so that we can tell, tell uh, all, about, all about what we're doing and uh, what we do. Um, and please uh, enjoy the free giveaways because we're giving away I Love Northern Beaches t-shirts and you can wear those to show that you were here on this night when, when democracy really ruled. <laughs> and uh, pick up a Climate Action Now sign to put on your front gate. Um, and tell everybody about us and join the MB Can Facebook group to find out what all the groups are doing up and down the Northern Beaches because they're a lovely group of people. Thank you very much.